Thank you so much for having me, Bosk. My name is Christy Valli, and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Biological Sciences at Kent State University. So today I'm going to talk about some observations I've made about how fields evolve over time. This is going to be a highly subjective personal story because, of course, I'm making this call from inside my field. And the interaction between technology and culture and science has fundamentally shaped my career path. And I think it's really important to talk about these things and reflect on them. In science, we like to pretend we're outside our systems, but that takes a lot of both our agency and our responsibility away. The reality is we are both made by and make our culture. Open science is an absolutely essential part of my personal research culture now, but it hasn't always been. So what I'm going to talk about today is um, to make the case for why open, inclusive, and synthetic science is not only essential, but a part of a natural progress within my field. So I'm a computational ecologist specializing in population and community ecology. I haven't always called myself that, and I don't think anyone was really calling themselves that 10 years ago. Um, if you'd asked me then, I would have said that I was a population and community ecologist, no modifiers, and full disclosure, I was absolutely desperate for this community to take me seriously as a capital E ecologist. I was just finishing my PhD in agricultural ecology, and I didn't get it. I was working in these simplified systems, uh, focusing on only a few species, and I was consistently floored by how inadequate that data that I was collecting was to actually answer the questions I was asking. Sure, you could find some general trends, but things were always so variable. And capital E ecology was this place where people were finding out these big general rules about how systems operate. And that was where I wanted to be. But to understand how ecology became a capital E, we've got to look a little bit at the history of the field itself. Ecology, as we think of it in upper income countries, is a pretty young field. It came into its own at the beginning of the 20th century, but underwent rapid expansion in high income countries after World War II during the expansion of the American and other university systems. The field of ecology really took off in the late 1950s, a time when American culture was starting to lean back into this idea of rugged individualism. Let's call it rugged individualism too. This time it's for capitalism. Basically, they leaned into this ideal of this lone wolf communing with nature. I have referred to this ideal of ecology as the cowboy myth. Now, ecology has always suffered from a bit of an inferiority complex about its place amongst the hard sciences. Ernest Rutherford is said to have said, all science is either physics or stamp collecting. But luckily, the field of frequentist statistics had also emerged around this time, and it was a way of dealing with scarce data. Finally, you had a way to take this mess, that is natural systems data, feed it into these nice prescriptive equations and find your truth. Um, I'm going to show you two examples of this uh, from this time in ecology. These studies are absolutely foundational to my field, and I personally use the theory developed them as a guide for a lot of my own work. Um, studying communities of insects. But they're also um, both studies that were completed by Canadian-born U.S. practicing ecologists. So you know if I'm asking questions, I do it out of love. This right here is Robert MacArthur, and he's famous for, among other things, his work demonstrating that similar organisms occupying the same spaces will partition into different parts within a habitat, which minimizes competition and allows the species to coexist. MacArthur conducted this study on a 9.4 acre parcel of land in Maine in 1956 and 1957. He worked all by his lonesome by observing how much time five different species of warbler, that's a bird, occupied different parts of white pine trees. This was an extremely low tech operation. The first year of the study, MacArthur didn't even have a stopwatch and he counted how long he, he observed each bird. So one, 1,000, two, 1,000. This work resulted in one of the most foundational pieces in my field um, with the somewhat underselling title, Population Ecology of Some Warblers of Northeastern Coniferous Forest that was published in Ecology, the journal in 1958. Another paper of that era with a somewhat underselling title was the 1959 Canadian entomologist paper by Buzz Halling, Some Characteristics of Simple Types of Predation and Parasitism. And as an aside, if you want to be a highly cited patriarch of ecology, our N equals two here suggests that you should use the word some in your paper titles. 
This is the study where Holling derived what is um, now known as the Holling's disk equation, which describes how a predator responds to different densities of prey and how it, and describes a curve like this one that you see here, where the, at low densities, predation is inefficient, and at high densities, a predator eventually gets satiated. But the data behind this famous experiment was collected by Holling by distributing sandpaper disks around a room, blindfolding his secretary, recording how long it took her to find the disks, repeated eight times. The secretary, Patricia Bake, was not a co-author on the 1959 study, but she's listed in the acknowledgments. So these and other studies like it became the canon for people practicing ecology today. They became cultural touchstones, the examples of how good ecology is done. But the thing is, they're also very different from how ecology is done today. For one, not to throw shade or discount the amount of work that MacArthur or Holling did, both of these are relatively small scale, small scope studies. They involve relatively small data sets and they make pretty broad generalizations from them. And so this leads to this issue of replicability and reproducibility. The MacArthur Warbler study was revisited in 2016 by a graduate student named Bick Wheeler. At, and at least in the published press coverage, the patterns that he was observing weren't nearly as clear as those observed by MacArthur, despite the student having access to better monitoring technology like video recorders. I couldn't find a published scientific paper on this after this 2016 press coverage. It's possibly because the study wasn't completed or maybe the work didn't give a sufficiently interesting result to make it into the literature. As for Holling's experiment, I, like many ecology professors, have tried to replicate it in the classroom. I use skittles instead of sandpaper discs to up the stakes. Let's just say my error bars are a little wider than Holling's famous figure. Nevertheless, this is the field that I emerged into when I started my graduate work in 2005. And this is me doing what might be described as a small scale study. Here I am in a growth chamber culling soybean aphid populations so I could track vital rates. Basically, I wanted to know how populations of these tiny critters could grow on host plants at different temperatures. I used this data to build a predictive model to understand when various life events would occur. And this was also my first lesson in how absolutely complicated ecology could be. After spending months carefully rearing plants, watching aphid eggs day and night until they hatched, moving these little buddies around on plants without ripping their faces off, which is harder than it looks, I developed a model. The model I developed worked really great in the lab. Air temperature was all we needed to predict when these tiny aphid eggs would hatch. But it didn't work in the field, which was really deflating for a new grad student. And it made me wonder if I had science in me, you know? Until we accounted for how much more heat the eggs would acquire in the sunlight due to infrared radiation, we didn't have an answer. It turns out the field environment was way more complicated than the lab. One of the things that frustrated me about the work I was doing during my graduate studies was this lack of generality. The data I could collect, and I spent a lot of time collecting data, it wasn't enough. It seemed like the more data I collected, in fact, the more caveats emerged. And then, if I tried to find generality in what I did, I'd write a paper and submit it, only to have reviewers comment that my findings were better suited to a small regional journal. Ouch. But they weren't wrong. How would I know if my findings didn't apply to aphids living in other places or another similar species? Even within my own studies, the data were so variable. When I helped others analyze their data, it was more of the same. I had this feeling of uneasiness that seemed to center around the statistics that I was trained to use to solve the problems. They always gave a binary answer. This is significant or it's not. So it's true or it isn't. But these tests seem really sensitive to the data I was feeding in and exactly how I structured my experiment, um, the data collection, and the statistical test. I remember doing calculations in my head about how many ladybugs I needed to have a certain response in a behavioral experiment um, for it to be statistically significant. And then sitting up at night, horrified that this knowledge might bias how I handled the beetles when I set up the experiment. So I trained an undergrad assistant to record the observations for me without knowing what outcome I was hoping for. So science was disconcertingly human. But as it turns out, 
other people were also thinking about these things. This interaction between statistics and human perspective and subjective experience and scale, all leading to this problem with generalities. In 2007, a paper came out in Biological Reviews by Nakagawa and Cuthill, which blew my mind right up. It was basically this exploration of how null hypothesis significance testing, the statistical tool that I had been trained to use to determine what truth was, was actually affecting how biologists and ecologists were asking questions and created the situation of binary thinking when biological systems are anything but. Um, furthermore, they were created for scarce data, this idea that you can only have a small sample of uh, part of the population and assuming everything else is even and this is random and this is a representative sample, this is what the whole population looks like. But the tricky thing is knowing how representative your sample actually is. And I learned a lot of things can bias your sample from messy nuisance variables to messy people. Now, sometimes you make the culture and sometimes you're just along for the ride. Nevertheless, my perspectives on what ecology is and how ecology could be were changing at the same time ecology itself was changing. Ecology as a field was starting to really invest in this idea of synthesis, that is bringing together diverse data, perspectives, and ideas to solve these bigger societal and environmental problems. Between the connectivity of society driven by the internet, the recognition of global scale problems that required urgent action, and increasing automation of environmental data collection, it became not just possible, but essential to look at ecology at, in new, much larger scales. The technology change enabled the science, but the culture of connectivity wrought by the internet, in my opinion, primed individual scientists to be receptive to it. So the big changes came a little bit later. The idea of synthesis started gaining momentum in the mid-1990s with the formation of the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, but started really gaining this strong popularity in the early 20-teens. So SUSINC, the National Center for Socioecological Synthesis, and the German Center for Integrative Biodiversity Research, IDIV, were both established in 2012. But the thing is, the goals of synthesis to be really realized, another cultural shift needed to occur. This movement towards open, interoperable, and shared ecology. In 2012, when I finished my PhD and started a postdoc, I signed on to a cool project at Michigan State where I thought I'd mostly be looking at niche partitioning in an invaded community of ladybugs. Like MacArthur, but with ladybugs. So that sounded pretty cool to me. What I didn't realize at the time was I was to be introduced to the, a completely different way of actually doing science, networked science. So this ladybug project was part of what's called the main cropping system experiment at Kellogg Biological Station. Uh, Kellogg is not just another research station. In 1989, they'd established this experiment as infrastructure to support interdisciplinary science and how um, to study processes in ecological systems and how they unfold over time at this site. Biogeochemists, ecologists, plant scientists, hydrologists, e economists, agronomists, and sociologists, they went beyond collaboration. They had these long-standing scientific relationships built on understanding interactions within these systems and how they unfold over years and years. To make this work, they needed to break down their disciplinary silos and work together um, to plan and maintain experiments, share data, and really deeply interact with each other's work. But what was more, although Kellogg Biological Station is definitely a unique and special place, there were 25 more of these sites all over the U.S., as well as one in French Polynesia and two in Antarctica, as part of this NSF-funded long-term ecological research network, where groups of interdisciplinary scientists were doing place-based networked research, just like that at Kellogg. I'd never worked like this before, but I couldn't get enough. I still count my lucky stars every day that I landed in such a fertile, empowering research environment that gave me this freedom and encouragement to make, to just make everything I was doing and the questions I was asking so much bigger. Scientists in the network paid special attention to data management, reproducibility, and collaboration because with a long-term experiment, the data you collect is not yours. It belongs to the experiment that was going before you got there and, and will likely continue after you leave. You're a piece of the puzzle, but you have to work with others to fit and make the whole picture. Despite being 
embedded in this really individualist landscape of academic science, the LTER sites had learned to foster this collectivist attitude of investing in culture. And yet, almost ironically, this network has also fostered the careers of some of the most prominent ecologists of our time, pro possibly because they aim to invest and promote people who act as stewards of science and the collective good. This is the environment that I came to define myself as a computational ecologist in. As a person who has her own work, but will also support others in analyses, and who bridges together data and people. In short, this is the place where I learned that the best science is done with the collective in mind. Now, I wouldn't say network science is exactly the same as open science. It's sort of creating a bigger, more inclusive silo, but it's an important precursor to it. It's a culture primed for open science. And when I was primed for this, I started thinking about how I could be an educator and a connector and a community leader. And I spent a year as a Mozilla fellow, which helped bring this plan into action and built a global network of like-minded people. Through this work, I was able to become an open scientist and a data scientist and a person who focused on synthesis. So I was a postdoc whose research focused on data analytics and building tools that enabled people to bring data together and then think about what it means to have processes unfold over time. So I built a program that would be about building network science into a truly open enterprise, one where collaborators and students could take a diversity of roles and work together to build something bigger, to be open to new ideas, diverse stakeholders, responsible to the public, and committed to sharing back. Okay, here's where we hit the next bump in the road. I was also a person on the academic job market, and there was still a lot of people not buying what I was selling. A really wise friend of mine, Kirsty Whitaker of the Alan Turing Institute, often talks about how academia is rife with survivorship bias. Essentially, the people who have survived, the ones that have blasted through, the people who have power now within the academic system have survived because of a combination of luck to be studying the right things that gave the right answers at the right times and hard work and doing some things a certain way. And there's this very human tendency to overcredit our hard work and actions we've taken and undercredit the impact of chance, culture, and being in the right place at the right time for in our successes. In short, good timing can make you look very clever. So when I hit the academic job market in the mid 20 teens, the dominant academic culture and the attitudes of the people in power had programs shaped by the cowboys of yesteryear. And so they didn't see how what I was proposing to do as a professor could possibly be viable. And in fact, this came into very sharp relief during my very first faculty job interview. Those of you in academia know how these interviews go. Um, there are two to three days trial by fire marathons where you give a research seminar, have a series of interviews with faculty, deans, human resources personnel, the works. And at this particular interview, after I'd given my talk, I had an exit interview with the search committee. After detailing my plan for a data intensive open science promoting insect ecology research program yet again, the search committee chair paused, cleared his throat and said, well, that's all fine and good, Christy, but what happens to your research when the data runs out? Taken a bit aback, I replied, well, if the data runs out, I'm sure my research program will be the least of our problems. I did not get that job. So my rosy outlook on being the change I wanted to be in the culture seemed to be in conflict with my survivorship. And my personal challenges were but a microcosm of this resistance to the, of the field to open synthetic ecology. I did eventually land a job, obviously, but getting there was a delicate balance between focusing on meeting my collectivist goals while investing in those individualist benchmarks I needed to gain the power I needed to affect cultural change. Late stage capitalism has fostered an environment of hyper competitiveness in academia. And it's a really huge risk to buck that paradigm, especially for early career researchers. And so the reality is for most scientists, it's not publish or perish. You actually have to buy into the paradigm or perish. Academia is very insidious and uses this criterion of fit to decide who gets to play. So to not go out of the way to show the survivors of this system how you fit with what their definition of good science is, is an ongoing threat to people working on the edge of the culture. 
And it's not just you that you have to support. One of my greatest reckonings that I've been struck with in developing my own research program is how the people who are with me and dependent on me depend on me for their livelihood. So when I take professional risks, I also take professional risk on behalf of my students and my support staff. So how do you, once you have power, use it for good? I think within all of our fields, there's some version of cowboy ecology, the values and structures of the past, which somehow both shape our scientific cultures and hold them back from being able to do the things that we value. It requires constant intentional vigilance to direct cultural change for something better. It requires investment and not to be cynical, but it does require a teeny amount of towing the line to the old cultural conventions. And I think we put a lot of pressure on students and people who hold the most precarious positions in the academy to be the change. And I don't think that's an entirely fair thing to do. You've heard all the calls to action where we say we need more education for our trainees and we need young people to step up. But I think that while that's really important, I think that lets later career folk off the hook more than I'd like to see. In a culture, people whose identities are least likely to fit or be regarded as newcomers are most likely to be dismissed when they suggest changes to practice or a value. And it's essential that those voices can both be heard and actively advocated for by those of us who've gained a modicum of power that they have in the system. So with that, I call to my fellow, let's say early mid-career folk, um, we've we have a huge responsibility to advocate and pave the way for open, inclusive practices. Ecology is now a place where the work I do isn't fringe, so that gives me a platform to do the work. And if you have a platform, what good can you do with it? So how about some specifics? When I talk about towing the line with the previous culture, I don't mean just rolling over, but zooming in on the things that are valued by the power holders and showing connection. Some of the things I found particularly effective is appealing directly to funding agencies. For me in the US, it's the National Science Foundation. I've served on many panels and spoken to many program officers directly so I could voice what's important to me and where I feel the field needs infrastructure or investment. Program officers listen. Uh, they want to know where you think the field is going. What I've found when I'm talking to my colleagues about open science and inclusive practice, it's key to focus on those shared values and not technology. Values help get the work done, but learning new technology takes time. Um, how will this approach help th them meet their goals and do the things they value? One of the quickest ways to lose a senior faculty member, I've found, is to have them think that you're trying to get them to do no more work with no reward. Figure out what they need and help them take baby steps towards a shared goal. And that brings me to another challenge. I think open science can be its worst enemies at the times. So for example, I see a lot of people pushing technological solutions to problems that many people outside the community don't necessarily see as problems or others fail to consider marginalized identities in their conception. A colleague of mine, Caitlin Stack Whitney, is leading some research on how universal design principles are incorporated or not into open science projects. And in general, they're not. Um, meaning that many projects have the potential to exclude people with disabilities. That's 15% of the world's population. There's also a failure to acknowledge that simply surviving in the academic system is not without constraint for many, many people. And these constraints are tighter for people with marginalized identities. The trick is here, if we're all working together to build this new culture, is to not fall into those same traps set by the previous paradigm. Be conscientious about what your goals are and consult broadly. I think it's key that open advocates and creators step back and consider the values before pushing a new approach and consult people that are different from them when developing a new tool or a new project. There was a recent case of an open science advocate creating a tool that was used to rank researchers, people, for how open their practices are. Um, not only is this super problematic to consider your individual opinion as the arbiter of what's open or not, 
but also using open technologies to make it easier to rank, bully, and exclude people is antithetical to what I see the goals are of open science. Some colleagues and I recently wrote a piece where we explored how open practices, when we didn't apply them thoughtfully, could actually exacerbate inequality rather than help it. Open science must never, ever be used to punch down. I'm now in the remarkably privileged place of being able to bring all the things I value most to my work. My lab focuses on using open reproducible practice to work at the interface of data and information. My group uses open data and data we've collected ourselves to look at the intersections of biodiversity and human activity. And we study not just the ecological patterns, but how the perspectives of the humans in the system, from those manipulating the experiment to those taking the data, affect the ecological patterns we observe. We don't just study insects, we study the data itself. In essence, my program allows me to embrace, study, and learn from the variability that once frustrated me because I get to study why is this data so heterogeneous and why do people studying these systems get different answers. It's inside and outside both about and dependent on open research. Some of the major problems I'm working on is examining the scientific controversy around what's known as the insect decline phenomenon. If all these researchers have access to the same data, then why, when trying to synthesize data around populations of insects, do people get radically different answers? Another project my lab is working on right now focuses on data mining legacy data produced by long-term ecological research sites. We created a tool which automates statistical decisions that a typical researcher might make and ask the question, what conclusions are most likely to be made by a researcher observing the system for different lengths of time? I also teach a course in quantitative methods where I lead students through not just statistical analyses and data management, but cultural considerations at every part of the scientific workflow. Um, I teach a graduate course in biological statistics where I'm able to lead students to question the binaries of Fisherian statistics, even as I teach them to do t-tests. And I'm not doing this alone. I have a lab full of passionate, motivated graduate students and researchers um, here to work with me on this mission. I've also been able to recently start a podcast um, with my colleagues, Rebecca Cato and Bridget Mulvey, a sociologist and an education specialist, respectively, where we discuss ideas about data science and open science and how culture and identity intersect with our ways of knowing. Academic ecology is changing from the cowboy field it once was, however slowly, to recognize more diverse contributions and contributions that aren't just these solo authored scientific papers. There's a lot of room to grow, but I intend to keep fighting the good fight. Um, I'll leave you with a small anecdote. We were currently working on revision of our tenure criteria in my department, which is a boring and thankless job. Um, and I will emphasize there have been numerous long meetings where faculty have debated what research productivity means. But in the previous iteration, the handbook really only recognized peer-reviewed papers. And after considerable debate, I managed to convince my colleagues that other research products, including software, should be included in this definition. It's a small change, but the word software is now incorporated into these guidelines. Progress sometimes happens in small, boring procedural edits. To close, in ecology, there's no danger of the data running out, but we do have to be mindful stewards of it and the culture of our field to help maximize its potential. I think that the key to this is embracing the variability of data, perspectives, and people in authentic, inclusive, open science. So just hang on and keep pushing for the things that you value, and I will stand with you. Thank you.